David or Denny, we just need to have someone there. On, there we go. All right. We are now joined by Denny Hamlin, driver of the number 11 Joe Gibbs Racing Toyota, and David Wilson, president of TRD. We are going to go straight to questions. Uh, we will kick it off um, with Alan Cavana. Hey, now, David, can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, David, uh, uh, I did just, it might not be an easy answer, but the, the process of trying to make something the same as, as the cars, I mean, but also make them different for the OEMs, how, how do you describe that this year's long process and trying to make something the same, but also different? Uh, hundreds of hours in the wind tunnel, Alan, <laughs> is, is really um, what it amounted to, because at the very beginning of this journey, when we were trying to draw lines around what we wanted with next gen. One of, the, one of the things that all three OEMs agreed on is, is more styling relevancy. And we wanted to, to, to get away from that big boxy greenhouse. Um, and, and to do that, we had to accept the challenge that we're gonna have cars that aren't as neatly in that arrow box that we've been used to over the years. So, um, so once we agreed to that parameter, then we went to work uh, collaboratively with, with our fellow uh, OEMs. And as, as I said, a lot of time in the wind tunnel. But the good news is, is we are comfortable between the three of us. We, uh, you know, submitted our cars. Gosh, it's, um, it was a while ago, actually. Um, and, uh, and certainly NASCAR is, is confident that, we're going to have reasonable parity and we, we know we have great styling. So that's all good. Yeah. And one thing I noticed too, with that is that if you look at the cars from the nineties and eighties and whatnot, you could tell what type of car it was. If they were all white, you could tell, okay, that's a Pontiac. That's a, whatever. these, if you weren't here, they look different. Like it's yeah. not just the same car with, Toyota headlights and taillights, right? It's, exactly. it's these cars are a lot different. All three of them have a very distinct and different look um, from the front and back. So it doesn't matter what the color scheme, like there is, it's not the same car with different decals on it. That's for sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to go to Claire B. Lang. Thank you. Denny, you guys are the best. You're the points leader. You're one of the best drivers in the field. Do you conjure up in your mind how long it might take for you to get used to the difference in this car? And do you have to have a lot of confidence to say, I'm pretty good at what I do, so yeah. I should be cream of the crop rising, you know? My dad always used to tell me when people asked, you know, I was moving up through the ranks, they said, oh, you might be moving them up too fast or this, that, and the other. He always says, listen, race car driving is race car driving. It's just a different machine, right? And, and you still, what I, I really took a lot of pride in is that when anything different got thrown my way, I feel like I adapted quickly, it, whether it be my rookie season, you know, winning at Pocono, that's a very unique track that nothing like I ever raced at before. Like I was able to adapt when we went through COVID last year, no practice and qualifying, me and my team were able to adapt to that. So I think that's where I hopefully will shine in this is that I can use my experience and information that we have to adapt to this whole new machine uh, quicker than everyone else. That's, that's my goal. And we we also, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I was talking to, to coach, you know, right next to the car and we were talking about exact, that exact same thing because from a technology perspective, you know, learning the car and, and learning where, there are margins to develop. Um, everything is so new. For us, we, we look at that as, as a massive opportunity because I think particularly the first year when we you know, get, get that car on track, there's gonna be, you know, we're gonna be drinking through a fire hose collectively the industry and those organizations and drivers who adapt first will get out front first. Mm -hmm. When do you think you'll get an idea, Denny? I mean, uh, you, you have looked at some of the changes. When do you think you'll have an idea of what you have to adapt to? Uh, I mean, ultimately, 
probably the first test in October. I mean, or whenever we, we do the open uh, organizational test with the car, I'll realize pretty quickly, you know, what I need to work on as a driver to adapt. You know, first thing offhand is that the, the shifting is different, right? So um, I'm going to need to adapt on road courses to that that side of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, who knows? I, I, I do not know exactly what until – I get out on a racetrack and, and feel this car out, but uh, I, I love change, you know, throw something different, uh, you know, my, our sales, you know, cocky drivers believe that we're better than everyone else. We're going to adapt quicker than everyone else. And that's what I believe. Thank you, Denny. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. You bet. Uh, next we'll go to Bob Pockers. Yeah. For Denny, do you have any idea what like the initial outlay will be as far as costs for a team like 23, 11 racing for, next year and i mean is that a concern or you know when you look long term this should be more economically viable than the current car there's ultimately so many unknowns that question is is hard to answer and i think that the simple answer is that it generally you know you're, you're having less parts and pieces that you're going to be developing so you know will you need to staff as many people as what you have currently I, I don't know that that's the case. You know, I think that this car has a potential, you know, to be better in the long run. I think that the, we looked at the model when we were thinking about starting a race team and we, this, this car was a factor in those decisions. And, but ultimately, you know, we, we have a lot of inventory that won't be good anymore. Right. So we have a lot of stuff that, that no, you know, not only just cars, I'm talking, you know, equipments and tooling and devices that we use on our current car that won't be good anymore. So we, it's not just buying a new car, you're buying a lot of different parts and pieces and, and uh, tooling devices as well. So I just think that it's a lot of unknowns. I think for us personally, we, we budget on the safe side to say that this car probably will be slightly more expensive for a couple of years. Um, and then we kind of see what happens after that. I think that crashes will play a big big bigger factor in your bottom line than what the current car does because ultimately when you have parts and pieces when you crash and you're manufacturing those pieces that costs less than buying a piece off the shelf um it just is you know you you always can manufacture cheaper than you can buy retail so um i think that that will be a bigger question mark to where the, the sustainability for the teams will be and we'll probably know that three quarters of the year into the first year, we'll understand the economic metal, uh, model quite a bit better and have a better understanding of, you know, where that model is in the future. But ultimately right now we are, we are making a lot of assumptions. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll go to Dustin Long. Thank you. Um, I have a question for, for Denny and, and one for David and for Denny, um, from an ownership point of view, is there a concern that there are more parts being provided by a single supplier as opposed to doing them yourself or having them done through JGR? And for David, so much talk about the future, what this car can mean. There's a lot of talk about, you know, maybe this brings in another OEM from your perspective. Why would you want another OEM in? Um, you know, from the parts and supply, you know, thing, I think that that's going to be probably a general concern all the way up until we get to Daytona. I mean, ultimately, you know, once we get into on track testing here in October, September, October, November, you know, we, we hope that this car puts on a better uh, racing product out on the racetrack. And if it, if we test and we find out, oh, you know, we might need to tweak some things. Well, now we're in a really tight timeline to get all those parts and pieces to everyone before Daytona. Um, single supplier, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of different, you know, manufacturers of parts and pieces. I'm okay with single supplier. Um, you know, I think that it, it makes it easier for everyone, especially if that supplier is right here, uh, in the home of, of, of NASCAR and a lot of the teams they can deliver, they can produce, uh, you know, have trackside services that that's all a very viable thing. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think the, immediate you know I, I you know the immediate concern and things that kind of keep you up in the night is like man are we gonna have enough parts in time and i think that that will once we get past the first part of the season i think everyone will have a sigh of relief that okay we're past the rush now 
I think we're going to be okay. And, and for you, David, just the, the perspective of a, another OEM, and sure. there's so much talk about it and, and why it's important for you. Right. Well, you know, clearly there were a number of criteria that went into uh, the, the definition of this car and the makeup of this car and, and what we wanted to achieve by putting this car on track. Um, one of them certainly is we need a car that's going to service our industry for years and years and years to come. We can't, we can't afford to do tear-ups every few years. Um, uh, one of the other ones we again talked about ad, ad nauseum is, is relevancy. And that, again, we're a car company going car racing. So of course we, we want as much relevancy as possible. Um, the, the, the other one or another one is, is absolutely um, about getting more competition. You know, I've in the lead up to this, I've talked a lot about, you know, I, I love that our car in many ways resembles a GT sports car, you know, and we, we help out Lexus on the sports car side. And what we love most about that series is we race against eight other manufacturers. So for Toyota, our whole philosophy is we compete on the showrooms with, you know, dozens of manufacturers. The more manufacturers, that we can compete on track, the better from our perspective. So I think the reality is the, the entry point um, with a car that we've been racing is just too steep to entice a new manufacturer. That's just, that's just reality. Um, we, we do believe that with next gen and the, the direction, the relevancy to an OEM, um, it's a reset that there's a, a, a much higher likelihood that we could see another OEM or two. Thank you. All right, next we'll go to Mark Darrow. Uh, thank you. Um, first for David, you know, Denny just talked about, hey, you know, we're like kind of like back to the 80s, 90s, the cars look, look a lot more, you know, like the street versions. Back then it was water cooler talk all the time. You know, well, this guy, this car has got the advantage. And, you know, that, that was part of the big debate that went along with what happened on the racetrack Sunday, a constant thing. Does this next gen car open up any of that? Or have you guys had to work so hard to look like your car, but still fit in a certain box? There, there won't be any of that. Well, Mark, so um, I talked about this on stage. We, we have this really special partnership with our design partner in, in Calti and and it's a very iterative process. They're the ones that, that designed the production TRD Camry. And so they kind of send their wish list. And then we take that and build something, take it to the wind tunnel, and we tweak it here and send it back to them. And, and, and we, we must have iterated on this car at least a half a dozen different times to make sure we struck the right balance between obviously styling and performance. Our job at TRD is to make sure we have a fast race car. Um, so relative to, to Toyota and our TRD Camry, we're, we're very happy with the product. Um, we, we spent just a, a countless uh, numbers of hours. Everything on that car, the smallest little edge um, and feature was intentional, is intentional. Um, but to, to your other comment, Mark, uh, about, you know, the water cooler talk and, you know, does the certain manufacturer have an edge over another, you know, listen, uh, we, we all again held hands and said, we want to race a Camry. Ford guys want to race a Mustang. And we, we went to work to set about, you know, establishing some parity. I, I'll say this, you know, we cannot be naive enough to think that that we got it right the very first time. There's gonna be things that we're probably gonna need to address as an industry um, as we get this car on track. We just, but we need reps first and uh, we need to give it in, into the hands of, of, our, of our drivers to, to mix it up and see what we got. But, um, but you know, again, the, what gives us confidence is the, the degree of engineering that went into it. Um, you know, I feel a question the other day about, well, you know, how, how do you know this is going to be any different than car of tomorrow? 
And, and my answer is, is one of the, the principal differences is we didn't have a collaboration between the OEMs and NASCAR back then. When we came in the sport, we were not a partner. We were not a stakeholder. We were a participant. Today, we're a partner. And, um, and, and this NASCAR is completely different than the one that, that existed when we came in the sport. Danny, what's your expectations? I asked Joey, you know, what he thought about it. His, his number one answer or the first thing he thought about was it was an opportunity, you know, so everybody's got the same thing. And so somebody has the opportunity to jump out ahead of the other guys a little bit quicker. How, what, what, what are you expecting when this thing hits the racetrack? Yeah, I agree with that sentiment. I think that we're still in the car racing business and still in the competition business. So we as drivers, um, you know, the, the more things become similar uh, on the racetrack, the more it comes in our hands to make the difference. So we have to identify as, as drivers, where where can we be better? Where where do we need to up our game to uh, to be competitive? So um, I, 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 I know enough to know what I don't know. And what I don't know is, you know, aerodynamics and, you know, schematics and all that stuff of race cars and and i understand that my job as a race car driver is to give this team and toyota all the information that i can early on to let them go out there and make adjustments to make my car faster and i think that we have you know a lot of smart people uh within 2311 joe gibbs racing and toyota to make you know this product uh, a winning race car very soon All right, next we're going to go to Greg Engel. Hey, guys. Um, David, for you, sir, you were talking about your job is to make these cars race fast, um, and you do that very well. Obviously, though, the, the job of Toyota is to put cars in driveways. And at the end of the day, do you think this car is even closer, like it was back in the day, to the old adage of win on Sunday, sell on Monday? I really do think that uh, that will be the case as Denny was talking about earlier, there's no mistaking that we're racing a TRD Camry. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of the, the progress that we've gone, you know, that, that, that the industry has taken towards that. With, even with Gen 6, it's so much better than what we've raced in the past. But, but this is a revolutionary, another revolutionary step forward. And, and I do believe that, you know, the, the, the mom or dad, you know, driving this, this beast of a TRD Camry is going to take more pride in, um, uh, in our success. And, uh, and that makes me feel good. That really does bring, bring me a lot of pride. And I talked about, you know, again, the fact that it's a TRD Camry that even closer aligns it to, you know, what we sell. And, um, and the data backs that up too. You know, when, when Toyota came into this sport, you know, a lot of it is if you look at the NASCAR fan sentiment of Toyota and its brand, they, I don't know that they were as welcoming to Toyota at coming in, right? Not, there's polarizing, right? Yes. And, and since then, and they see how invested Toyota is in the sport that they love in NASCAR, that sentiment shows it has dramatically changed and they're more apt to when they're going to go buy a car go to a toyota dealership now than they ever were because they are welcoming of that brand in yes. america on the racetrack that's that's a a huge point denny and i'm glad you brought that up uh you know we when we came in it was it was absolutely polarizing and um and 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 that our biggest success is is that over the years we've, um, I think we've demonstrated that we we're going to be respectful to the sport. Uh, we demonstrated that we were going to earn our way. Um, we struggled in the early days, as everyone remembers. Um, but but as Denny pointed out today, you know, it's not that we're turning Chevrolet fans into Toyota fans. That's not what it's about. But even the Chevrolet and Ford fans. Most of them will acknowledge their sport is better because Toyota is a part yeah. of it. And so, it, again, as Denny pointed out, when it's time for them to look at their next family sedan, the data is showing they're yeah. walking into a Toyota dealership. That's right. Outstanding. Thanks, guys. Denny, have fun this weekend at Darlington. Appreciate it. 
Uh, next, we're going to go to Deb Williams. Thank you. This is for David. Uh, kind of expanding on the character lines of the Camry. When you started to, with a clean sheet of paper, you had the opportunity basically to put stock back in stock car. In addition to the character lines, what were some other things about the Camry that you wanted to make sure got into this particular car? Well, again, what, what, what we all saw today obviously was principally the, the body um, and, and the, the styling, and, and we've talked about that. Um, one of the other things that were very important to, to Toyota, as well as our colleagues at Ford and Chevrolet, was, was more technological uh, relevancy. And, and so, um, you know, the, the general suspend, you know, and independent suspensions, independent rear, independent front, um, you know, a rack and pinion steering, um, you know, there are some low hanging fruit that, that we've been waiting for years and years and years to, um, to bring to the racetrack. And, and so it took a lot of courage and commitment from the entire industry, all of the OEMs to say, okay, let's, let's do this one right. And let's address all of these things that we've wanted to see on a NASCAR race car for years and years and years. You know, one of the most notable things, again, is that, that beautiful 18 inch, you know, BBS forged aluminum wheel. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a wheel guy. First, you know, when I get my, my production car, the first thing <laughs> yeah. I do is make sure it's got the right shoes on it. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, that just that just makes the car look so good. Okay, thank you. You bet. And we're going to wrap up with Alex Andrzejew. Hey there, I'm uh, Denny. I'm hoping to get your perspective as as a team owner and trying to understand what this the fact that NASCAR is going to seven cars per team next year with next gen, what does that do? Like, what's the benefit from a cost perspective? And then as you were kind of mentioning before, looking at a larger investment up front, but then maybe cutting costs over time, can you kind of explain where that's coming from? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, teams will probably start out with a lesser number than that. To be honest with you, I, before we would we would take all the cars that we could. We had 15 cars, I think you could have per car number, and they were all specialized. We had road course cars, super speedway cars, short track cars, intermediate cars, and they were all specialized. And we would build the bodies according to, to what each track needed. Well, with this and and this composite composite body, you know, we're not bending anything anymore. You know, the, the shape is the same, and that shape will be the same at Talladega as it is at Watkins Glen. So. From our perspective, you know, I think in the beginning, the teams probably will will err on the side of lower inventory than just going out and saying, okay, I need seven cars for car 20, seven cars for car 18 and 11, and so on. I think they're, they're liable to go smaller until they understand how much inventory they're actually going to use. Um, and then again, also hedge their bet a little bit against change orders, you know, because what happens when we need to change something for safety reasons or competition reasons, you don't want to waste that money. So um, I think that having a lower inventory is, is good. I think if we raced all the same car with our current car, we could do it with seven, but we don't, we have specialized bodies for each individual track and this composite body doesn't allow you to do that. So you, you don't need the 15 cars like you have currently or, or whatever it might be. So uh, I think it just allows us to have a lower inventory. Um, certainly you'll have to have a, a good inventory of parts and spare parts uh, for crashes, but uh, overall chassis, um, I think that, uh, you know, that's probably a good fair number. Thank you. All right. Well, Denny and David, thanks so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to seeing the new car on the track and I uh, really appreciate your time during this exciting day. All right. Thank cool. you all for having us. Thank you.